Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. So far in Romans chapters 1 through 6, we've been told that we are loved by God, been given the gift of grace, were made and are called saints, were given peace with God, God has nothing against us, given God's righteousness, made the very righteousness of God in Christ, told that righteousness will reign unto eternal life, uh, and all of this based on the faithfulness and the obedience of Christ, justified, made righteous, where that we establish the law through grace, where we are the children of promise, blessed, given hope, given a sure standing in grace, and access to God's grace, made to persevere, given character, deliverance, reconciliation, made dead to sin through our death with Christ, buried and raised with Christ where we then walk, then we walk in newness of life, his life, not our own, not according to law, but grace. Since there's nothing good in the flesh, and all of this, all of that, just in the first five to six chapters, and we've just now begun to get into chapter six. Yet modern Christianity in the main has elected not to reveal these most precious and vital truths to God's people. Why? Because it does not fit their human merit-based world religious system philosophy. All of that, and we have yet to, to be commanded to do anything. And I want you to think long and hard about that. In the pre, uh, previous chapters, the preceding chapters, we've seen what God has done with our sin. And now we are entering into what God has done with ourselves, the vehicle of sin. I always love that word, vehicle, vehicle, the agents of sin, the slaves of sin, not sin as to its guilt, which unfortunately, sadly, many have not even yet come to comprehend that fact, but sin as to its ruling, its governing power. We know God has settled the sin issue as far as its penalty was concerned, or at least we should know that. He laid all of our sin on Christ. We are now about, uh, it's, it's so that the sin issue will not be master over us. Deliverance from sin is a slave master, which, which we'll find out is much different a means or a method than the world religious system would have us believe. Because we have already been, already been, sufficiently made aware of the fact that the nature of sin in which there dwells no good thing, if you, whether you call that the old man, the flesh, the sin nature, is what we desire to be delivered from. Simply put, the natural carnal mind, which, which is bound up in a religion of self-deliverance, self-governance, self-confidence, has made the grave mistake of believing that it can and should free itself from the slavery of sin by means of, get this, by means of the very thing which we need deliverance from. I, I don't... I don't know how to say it in any other way. It, it would be like us trying to extinguish a fire with fire. I suppose that's not a very good illustration either. It's not only a futile attempt at trying to employ a method which is in itself ineffective. I mean, that's, that's bad enough. It is so ridiculous, so illogical, so irrational, so unbiblical 
that it, it has somehow come to believe that in order to resolve the issue of the flesh, the old man, the sin nature, it not only can but must employ the old man, the flesh, the sin nature to do it. Are, are you are you following this? We we can't take yeast that is no good and expect it, you know, expect that it'll make the dough rise. And and even that really fails to adequately illustrate the point that I'm trying to make here. How about how about this? All right, you live in a country that is ruled by a dictator, and yet in order to free yourself from that dictator, you try and remove or rehabilitate that dictator. Folks, I, I wish that there was a better way of saying, this is why I mentioned in my last video, I don't think there's any really, really good illustration that we can give on anything that illustrates pure biblical truth. There are nations that are free, and there are nations that are not free. The, the ideal remedy is to render the dictator powerless by means of a system of democratic freedom. Uh, all right, enough with the illustrations. Perhaps you get the point here. Many of you are listening to uh, our co-crucifixion with Christ being taught from uh, the church that you go to. Some of you are not. I, I want you to look at both sides of the cross colon, okay? Christ died for our sin, for, F-O-R. The child of God has died to sin, T-O, to sin, in the likeness of his death. The knowledge that Christ died for our sin as our substitute, we know, is indispensable to our justification. Every Christian I know would agree with that. The knowledge that we died to sin is indispensable to our sanctification, our life, our spiritual growth, our walk, our conduct, our behavior, however you want to, in whatever terms you want to couch it. Most every Christian understands that Christ died for their sin, yet it's the same word of God that declares that we have died to sin, having been crucified with Christ. It's long been a question as, as to why Christians are not taught, you know, this most obvious, most precious, most vital truth, more often from the pulpit. My personal belief and I'm not alone in this belief, and I don't ask anyone to agree with me on anything, much less this, is that a sovereign God obviously never intended that it be, though it is the birthright of every child of God. It is your birthright. It has to do with every single child of God. Of course he wants his people to know that they've been crucified with him, that they have been buried with Christ, buried with him, and raised with him to walk in newness of life. Of course, he wants every one of his children to know that. But I believe that the reason why it is so seldom taught, other than the fact that man, the modern gospel today is so man-centered, is for at least two reasons. One, he reserves his best for those who really mean business, who really want it, and two, the ignorance of this truth in the body of Christ, the absence of it, it helps actually serve as an instrument of strength in the lives of those who do. Anything that sets his people apart from the world religious system as a whole, it's, that picks them up and sets them down in a desert where they're all alone, which assists in strengthening their faith, when there is no one around to have fellowship with in, in some aspect of spiritual truth, when, when all has been forsaken, when, when we've been abandoned, when we've been rejected, when we've been left alone, we are left to place our trust in the God of this book alone. 
The cross of Christ is a dark and a lonely place. But there's also the resurrection side of that death. We died with Christ. We don't remain on that cross, though we die daily to it. As we continue to live on the resurrection side of it. Reckoning ourselves daily. It's an ongoing activity. To be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is where we've come, folks. In our present study, the grace continues to abound. The grace continues to go on. If you've ever wondered what it really means to walk in the Spirit, well, we are now being given our first introduction to it. Our sins were dealt with by the blood, and now we ourselves are dealt with by the cross. The blood can wash away our sin, but it can't wash away our old man. We need the cross to crucify us. Not in the sense that we need to die to sin, that we need to crucify ourselves, but know that we have died to sin. It is upon the basis of this fact that we are to move forward, building upon that fact as we travel through the rest of the entire New Testament. Everything, everything, and I'm, I mean everything, stands or falls upon what we have established as a foundation to support it. And the cross of Christ is central to our understanding all the rest. It opens the door to all the rest. Amazing how that the Holy Spirit moves forward from its amazing declarations concerning our justification, our being made righteous, into the realm of our being set apart, sanctified for our master's good use, our entire fallen, sin-ridden, sin-ruined, sin-sick self, with all of its passions, all, all of its will, all of its desires, is judged and crucified. And we are not being called upon to crucify ourselves. The text is clear. Folks, the text is clear. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Galatians 5.24 Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you have been crucified with Christ, and you didn't do it. It's been said that crucifixion is the only method by which one cannot commit suicide. Now, I, I don't know if that is true or not, but what I do know is that you might get one hand nailed to that cross, but you'll, you'll have an awful hard time getting your other one nailed to it. I don't think I could even do it using ropes. I mean, and I was a sailor and I was pretty good at, at tying knots. Think back, folks, just think back on how with, with great joy, with great overflowing joy, you came to realize, for the very first time, you came to realize that Christ died in your place. Freedom from guilt. Freedom from the penalty of sin. We're now beginning to look at emancipation. Freedom from slavery. The slavery of sin. The mastery of sin. If we fail to consider this all-important truth, 
then self will remain the domineering factor in the life. You'll, you will continue to serve God in the very flesh that God took down into death with himself at Calvary. You will continue to employ that which God has crucified to try and make use of that which he put to death, which God has determined worthless, what God has rendered ineffective to try and produce the righteousness of God. I don't know how to put it any plainer than that, folks. I honestly do not. We have to now go to the next step and accept, not call God a liar, except that we have died with him. We can't skip over this step. I know I'm, I'm jumping ahead here, but knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him, Romans 6, 9. Are you hearing this? Verse 10, the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Folks, what was true of Christ is true of us because we have been identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. When he died, we died. When he was buried, we were buried. When he was raised, we were raised to walk in newness of life. We weren't merely a bystander. We were a participant in that death that he died. How? Because we were in him when he died. The only reason we have eternal life is because we're in the one who's eternal. When he died, he took every one of you, every one of you down into death with him. But he did not leave us there on that cross to die a miserable, agonizing death alone. I've, I've mentioned this before. I know. I know I have at some point. The fact that when, when we place a living seed, that seed is alive. It's not dead. It's alive. We place it into the cold, dark, damp earth. It dies. And as a result of that death, it brings forth fruit of its own kind. We can't plant a seed of corn and a patch of squash come up. Did you know? I mean, are you aware of the fact, the wonderful, the glorious fact, the beautiful fact that the very spiritual reality that the text is introducing to us here, that God has illustrated in this fact in nature itself? If you are a Christian and a farmer, any, all, any of you farmers out there, or, or if you're a Christian and a gardener, I do not see how you can miss this. Oh, dearly beloved, you have been crucified with Christ, buried with him and raised with him from the dead to walk in newness of life, is life. I want us to spend some time in, the, in this text over the next couple of videos looking closely at many of the specific words in the text. Know ye not that so many as, as of uh, us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory, that's the travail of his soul shall be satisfied. I just had to, to throw that in there. By the glory of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life, and, and this is the first mention of our walk. 
And the text goes on to read, for if, and that's a first class condition, if we have been, and we have been, planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and the word there means annulled, rendered inoperable, ineffective, useless, not destroyed in the sense of eradicated or eliminated, but rendered inoperable, rendered ineffective, that henceforth we should not serve sin, that sin shouldn't be the dominant domineering factor in our life for he that is dead is freed from sin now if and we have another first class condition here since we be dead with Christ and we are we believe that we shall also live with him knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, in the same way, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This baptism is not water baptism, nor is it a relationship to law, cleaning up the old man. One more verse, 1 Peter 3, 21. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God did the baptism. The baptism of our text is something that God did, not man. It is a spiritual baptism, baptized into the body of Christ, identified with Christ. Kind of like the denim shirt that you see. Uh, on the screen here has become just like it's become identified with the whitener that turned it white so that's it uh, this is just kind of an introduction into the passage that we're going to be looking at here and so well hello Coco hey Coco this is my little buddy my little yeah, what? Is, what? Huh? Coco says he loves you, and I love you too. I love you. I truly do. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.